We are so glad you are here this afternoon. Um, this is our dementia seminar. Um, we're going to get some dementia facts from Kathy Adkins. Many of you will know her. She's a longtime friend of Asbury. Um, she has been asked by the American Alzheimer's Association to be one of their educators. So we are excited that we could find the time to work all of this out. There's numerous handouts on your table, but there is one that's kind of small, and it's this one, the Empowered Senior Series. Kathy may tell you a little bit more about it, but it's a series that they are holding, and once you attend, you can get this stamped and go to Botanica. No, so it's at Botanica. It's at Botanica. And you can get in the garden. Yep, a complimentary garden pass after every seminar. This is These are dates that are gonna be happening at Botanica, and if you wanna, learn more or get a little more educated than these classes is there a charge then for the class so it's all free which we love free <laughs> it's a good good thing so if you would like a copy of this because I don't have a lot of copies on the table please ask me I'm happy happy to run some off uh, in the office before you go today and make sure you have the dates if you would like them so Okay, I'm going to go do that while Kathy gets started. So Kathy's sponsor and mentor is Gus Torres, and so we're going to allow Gus to come on up here and introduce Kathy. Thanks, Chris. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Gus Torres. Um, my you wife over it. there, Amy Torres, and my daughter, Zoe. And um, as a owner of a home care agency, we provide home care and assistance for seniors so they could become there you go. or stay independent in their own home. Um, and part of that is not only providing a good service, but also helping those out in the community um, whenever I get a chance. And um, I've known Kathy for over a year. Her and I hit it off. She's, she's just got a wealth of knowledge. She's just one of those people you just want to be around so you could get smarter. You know, um, so she invited me to her very first um, Dementia Facts talk, and I saw so much value in it, and I just really wanted to be a part of it, so I, I told Kathy, I said, Kathy, I'd like us to be able to go to a lot of places with this, and I want to I wanna be your sponsor. I want to make sure that you could keep doing it and, and be a part of it. Um, so anyways, um, Kat, this is Kathy Atkins. I'm super happy to have her here today. And um, she's going to tell you a little bit of stuff, a little bit about herself, and then she's going to go into her talk. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay. Now, how about I get this kind of out of the way? That's good. And can everybody hear me? Okay. I'll use my teacher voice. Maybe I'll bring that back closer. I have to thank uh, Asbury and Pastor Susan and uh, Gus and A Better Solution Home Care for making this possible to be with you today. I do these talks at a lot of churches. I also do health uh, talks at Sunday school, so if you'd like your Sunday school class to have me come in and talk on a lot of general health topics, they're, they're always very well received. And that uh, just call me and we'll get it scheduled. But uh, I've been a nurse, so I'll tell you a little bit about myself and then we'll jump into the dementia problem. I've been a nurse in, here in Wichita for over 45 years. I've been a nurse educator for over 10 years. I teach for five different colleges. Um, I've got a couple of master's degrees. I'm working on a doctorate. I've got several certifications. And as Pastor Dennis used to say, I make him tired, which is kind of hard to do if any, most of you know who Pastor Dennis is. But uh, I'm continually learning. Uh, I'm a wife. We just celebrated our 50th wedding anniversary. Uh, a mom, an aunt. Uh, I lost my sister about five years ago to Alzheimer's disease. Uh, I've known about Alzheimer's since I started being a nurse back in 1974. But uh, it hits home when it takes one of your family members and you see the, the person leave the body, but the body lingers on for a while. Is that any better? Oh, All good. right, I'll just stay close to it. All right, um, and kind of enough about me because the time that I, and I try to be very, very careful of your, uh, your time, I appreciate 
you're taking your time to be here today. Uh, so we'll skip over lots of things about me and we'll jump into Alzheimer's and dementia. I used to say there were, I used to say, I used to say there were 13 different kinds of dementia. In the last month, they've decided that there are now 14 different kinds of dementia. Alzheimer's is, makes up 60 to 70 percent of that dementia population. Chronic uh, traumatic encephalopathy that you've heard a lot about with football players uh, that, uh, let me not get his name wrong, that Dr. Will Omalu discovered back in 2015 and had to fight the NFL to make them to actually admit that this was a problem. Um, the only reason I bring that up is because the, uh, I teach for the National Certification Council of Dementia Practitioners out of New Jersey. It's the, considered the gold standard for dementia care in the United States. And they at the conference brought up that we have, we have dementia coming on that we don't even realize is going to happen. And it's coming from younger people. Part of it's coming from younger people who are using illicit drugs in ways that nobody ever intended. And another part of it is coming from youngsters who are through no fault of their own out there in football, soccer, cheerleading, gymnastics, chronic head injury, chronic. You don't have to be knocked out to have a problem. But once you are become unconscious, you're much more susceptible to further injury from there. So there's a wave of dementia that's coming at us, you, uh, that we don't even think about and don't even really know about right now. I listened to a trauma conference with Dr. Uh, Graylinger. He's a neuroscientist, neuro neurologist here in Wichita. And he said, I want you to think about this thing up here that, that takes is 2% of your body weight, consumes 20% of your body energy. And think about that. You'd think the heart or maybe the liver, uh, those muscles would consume more. No, this consumes more energy than anything else in your body. He so said, think about that as a big bowl of jello. And in this big bowl of jello, there are millions of these little trees, these really straight trees that are in there. And the first time that you have a concussion, the first time you don't get past what you meant to go to, some of those trees are broken. And those trees never line back up perfectly. Now your brain goes through a process between, between the ages of about 16 and 25. And this is a normal process it goes through. It's called pruning. Has anybody heard of that, about your brain doing pruning? It's the same thing as gardeners. You know, you go out in your garden and you look at the tree and you go, oh, it's so misshapen, I, I need to trim here and I need to trim here. Well, your brain somehow, you know, we are fearfully and wonderfully made and we'll never understand why the wherefores of all of our body processes. But the brain decides, well, you don't need that piece of information and I don't think you need that one and you certainly don't need that one. So I'm just gonna snip it. If young people before the age of 25, because that's when they decided that the brain is actually formed fully, the drugs or the alcohol that young people take do this pruning. And there's no rhyme or reason to what it prunes. That's why you've all run into some young person who's been heavily involved in whatever, and you know that the lights are on but nobody's in the house, or whoever's in the house doesn't uh, quite understand how to work the house anymore. So that's why I think it's important, I think it's really critical that I get out there to as many places as possible. I am the only dementia specialist in the state of Kansas. When I found that out, it was kind of like, are you kidding me? Um, there was one other one and she has just kind of vanished. And as I tell people, it's kind of like taking, getting a drink from a fire hose anymore because it's just a huge wave of people needing information. And I'm more than happy to get out there and do what I can. I am a teacher at heart. 
I thought being a nurse was the greatest thing in the world for 45 years. And then I found teaching and I found, oh, you can combine teaching and nursing and this is really pretty good. So I have truly found my calling in that respect. But uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, the impact on families. Families who care for a family member with dementia are not paid. I just sat through the Lunch and Learn with the Alzheimer's Association and those are every month and everyone is welcome to those down uh, on East Douglas by uh, the canal route. They had it figured out in dollars and cents and it was so many billions of dollars that are, are lost and more will be lost because families have to care for someone with dementia. Now, I'm gonna pick on you two. You are both still working, you're both bringing in an income, and he has Alzheimer's. He's diagnosed with dementia or Alzheimer's suddenly. Who's gonna care for him? You, right? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you're going to care for him. So his income's immediately lost. Isn't yours too? Because it, you can't possibly hold down a, a full-time job or an occupation and care for someone with Alzheimer's. Those purple sheets that are on the table, on the bottom of those, there is a very, very small um, bibliography that gives you a start to start trying to go through some of the documents and some of the books and some of the research that I've been through over the last few years. So you can start your own journey of learning this stuff, but the, they're expecting that Alzheimer's and dementia will bankrupt our healthcare system within the next 10 years if something's not done. And bless the Alzheimer's Association, they're out there trying to do research and have walks and, and yes, it, it's very, very vital, but here's the thing. That's like closing the barn door and the horses already in Reno County. It, it's, it's doing something, but it's not solving the problem because the horse is still out there running free. And most people ask, well, what's the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia? Uh, there isn't a whole lot. I told you there's 14 different dementias. Alzheimer's is one of them. Uh, we know that if you have a dementia or you have Alzheimer's, you're going to have problems. It's all going to come out the same. You're going to be a person in need of care because you're gonna lose your ability to make decisions, correct decisions for yourself. You've got a little bitty tiny part inside your brain and it's called a hippocampus. It kind of looks like a C. And that hippocampus is where the new memories and new thoughts and everything are settled. So when that hippocampus, when you start seeing symptoms of Alzheimer's, they say that there's probably not more than 10% of that hippocampus left. So 90% of that hippocampus has already been destroyed by the time you start seeing symptoms of Alzheimer's or dementia. I'm gonna tell you some things that I have gleaned from the research, and um, I probably have a thousand research documents at home that I have poured over and gone through and highlighted and underlined and everything to bring what little I'm bringing to you today. You also have some brochures and stuff on your table if you'd like to get with me outside of this, uh, because there's no way in 45 minutes that I can go over everything in depth with you. And I work with a lot of different people, one-on-one, -on -one, helping them keep things straight. They're also saying that Alzheimer's dementia starts 20 to 30 years before you see symptoms. And the medications that we have out there that treat the symptoms, the Namenda, the Exelon, and so forth, so that means that you probably ought to be on those 20 or 30 years ago, right? How come you're not? How come you're not on those medications 20 or 30 years ago? Mm, they existed. Hmm? How about money? Is your insurance company gonna pay for something that you can't prove you have the problem? 
And I know some of you have had that terrible shock of going to the pharmacy. And you, and I'll just use my eye doctor. Um, some of you I know have the same problem. I left work one day and I felt like somebody poured salt and sand in my eyes and it was like, what is this? Uh, a little symptom called dry eye. Okay, went to the optometrist and he gave me a script. Uh, and I usually don't have my scripts filled at Dillon's, but this day I had to pick up some things for dinner, so I stopped by the pharmacist, and I handed the little little girl the slip of paper, and I said, I don't want to fill this right now, but I need to know how much it is. And her reply was, I don't think I can tell you that. I said, were well, we just going to haggle at the cash register over the price? And about that time, somebody reached over her shoulder, snatched it out of her hand, and went somewhere I couldn't see. And we're talking about a bottle about this big, two and a half mils. And they came back a couple of three minutes later, and they said, it'll be $400. I said, I want my piece of paper back. Thank you very much. And I got my groceries, and I went out to the car, and I called the eye doctor back, and I said, have you lost your mind? And he said, Oh, that's okay. I can order you one that's only $12. Well, why did you write this out in the first place? You have been in this situation, I know some of you have, or you know somebody who has, that they've gone to the pharmacist and you about have a heart attack on the price. It's outrageous. I teach pharma uh, pharmacology for nurses, and I tell them I'm not a pharmaceutical-friendly nurse because you're not sick because you lack pharmaceuticals in your body. But it's the best thing that the pharmaceutical company, you become a cash cow to them. I'm sorry to say that, but you are. And your doctor isn't trying to be part of this process, but I want you to think about who educates your doctor after he gets out of school. The, pharma, the, pharmacology, or the pharmacy industry is who educates him after they get out of school. So his go-to or her go-to is to write a script, here, take this, take this. That's not quite always the best thing. We can't actually diagnose Alzheimer's per se until you die. And we look at the brain and we section it and we say, yes, there's the tau plaques and there's the tangles. Now, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but I want, you know, those skinny trees I talked to you about. You have an impulse. Your brain or you think, I want to raise my hand up. Well, your brain has to send this impulse through all these neurons down the fibers out to your hand to make the muscles contract to pick the hand up. Okay, that's good. But between these neurons, you have this little gap, this little. And I want you to think about a, a horse on a jumping course. You know, they run and they run and they jump and they run and they run and they jump. Well, that's how the impulse does in your neurons. It travels down the neurons and it has to cross this little, what they call, synaptic gap to get over to the next neuron. And there's lots of little chemicals in there that help that fire and get over to the next neuron to go do what it needs to do. <coughs> um, that synaptic gap begins to be choked off. So the horse is running down the course, and it's stopped right there. They have even discovered some things that are scary about some of you take medications for uh, gastric problems, um, gastric esophageal reflux, heartburn, and so forth, Privacid, Prilosec, Nexium. There's a, a plethora of them out there. There's even research out there that's implicating those strongly in totally blocking that synaptic gap. So the nerve impulse can't go anywhere at all. Okay, so what do I do about my heartburn if you say I can't take those drugs? Well, you find other things, other ways to handle the problem if possible. And if, that's the, if pharmaceuticals is the only way, then it is the only way. But you need to enter into that relationship understanding that you're kind of inviting dementia into your life. There is a brand new F18 PET scan. Uh, it sounds like a jet, but it's not or a keyboard, or a key on the key, uh, computer board. And now they're saying that they can, they can pick up the tau plaques and the tangles with this F18 scanner. I'm sure it's extremely expensive. 
Caring for someone with Alzheimer's or dementia has uh, proven to have a very negative relationship on your health, your employment, your emotional health, your financial security of many caregivers. There's a book that's listed on that purple sheet and it's called The 36 Hour Day. It's not a new book, but it's a very accurate book. And I know some of you in here personally who have had to deal with this problem and you know this is all too serious a fact that it feels like you need 36 hours to take care of someone that has dementia because you can never relax, you can never sleep, you can never, you can never let your guard down. You hear the silver alerts all the time. Um, and every time I hear one, it's, it's just wounds my heart to think that there has to be a better way to keep track of people. But when everything is said and done, you have kind of like two choices. Either home care, which is where Gus and Amy come in to try to help you take care of that situation, or we have facilities. And I know any number of you, because I'm, I'm right on the same age, gender, with quite a few of you, you said, I am not going to a facility. I am not. That would be good if we always were able to make that choice. But sometimes there comes a time when that, it's just the, the question is not on the table anymore. Because your family can't do it anymore. Alzheimer's is the sixth leading cause of death in the United States. Average uh, length of age or average length of duration is four to eight years, but it could last for up to 20. And, you know, finance as always has to enter into some of this discussion. And I don't know if any of you have five to seven to eight thousand dollars a month set aside in your your account to, to pay your mortgage? I don't. Well, that's how much a care facility is. And I'm not talking the top of the line. I'm talking average every day. And that's kind of a scary thing. My husband's 80, almost 81. We were driving home from the doctor's office one day, and I can't remember what the discussion was, but he said, you know, we probably ought to check into that long-term care insurance. I've had this discussion with him about 30 years ago, and he was not having it. And I said, honey, that ship sailed a long time ago, and I think it sunk. So that that's not even an option for you and I. And I said, we'd have to empty all of our bank accounts and, and still be in debt to those people. And there's a number of companies who won't even accept people for long-term care insurance anymore. If you have it, you're a very wise person. If you don't have it, there are wonderful financial people out there that you need to go talk to. I'll be glad to uh, put you in touch with them and see what you can do. But I'm telling you, it's kind of a scary future when you look at that kind of funds, because I don't think any of us in this room have that kind of money. So you're going to stay home, and you're going to take care of the person with dementia. Okay long, arduous, difficult, frustrating. Um, here's my next question. Who's going to take care of them when you're gone? Women, we usually outlive the men. Um, we're usually younger when we get married. Um, you die, who's going to take care of him? Uh, I know you guys are really good and self-sufficient and everything, but you've gotten used to having somebody else do a whole lot of things. And when dementia sets in, there's even going to be um, a deeper hole that you're going to be in for that time, because there's a whole lot of emotional things that go through with this. Um, also want to remind you or tell you, there, also, there is a genetic uh, testing. Uh, after 50 years of marriage, you run out of presents to give each other, you know, and I was sitting around thinking, what would be an interesting Christmas present to give, your, give my husband? And I thought, well, that 23 and Me is on the TV all the time, and that, that would be really cool to know what the heritage was. And they're talking about this, this medical component to it, this medical profile, health profile to it. They're the only ones that have it, and I know I don't have any stock in 23 and Me. <clears throat> so I got it for him, and it came back 
you know, four weeks later, something like that. And what his, his nationality that was interesting, he was kind of right, kind of wrong, you know, families usually are. The interesting thing was it came back that he did not have the gene for Parkinson's. He did not have the gene for Alzheimer's. He did not have these other genes. That doesn't mean he's in the clear. It just means that the genes aren't there. So it costs like, sometimes you can get it on sale for $99, sometimes it's $149. And there are any number of people who say, well, I don't want to know. That's okay. You know, I wouldn't, I'm not sure I want to be tasked with the responsibility of knowing the day I die. Some people go, I want to have my things in order and I want to be able to plan. And other people say, it's in God's hands and that's where we're going to leave it. There is no right answer to that question. It's what's right for you at the moment. But if you don't have the genes, that means you need to take some steps. And there are steps that you can take that are research-based that will help you avoid going down that path. Is it going to be 100% for everyone? Absolutely not. I don't think anything is 100% for everyone. But you're going to have a lot better uh, chance of not having to go down that. We've got many, many, many uh, hundred-year-old people around that don't have any type of cognitive decline. They're just as sharp as a tack. Uh, Kate News did an article or did a story about a lady who's 105 and she's out buzzing around and driving and um, taking care of other people. So, you know, it's just like heart disease. If you have the family history and you have the genes for heart disease, then it, you owe it to yourself and your family to take care of everything you can. As Dr. Barry Murphy used to say, if you have the genes for heart disease, you better modify all the risk factors that you can. And these, what I'll go over are some of the tips to try to think about making these changes, get your hands on some of those books, and start reading. Knowledge is power. And the more you know about the disease, the better you're able to deal with it. Um, diet. When I do these talks at churches, I usually tell them, I'm going to run your Sunday donuts because you're not going to look at them the same way again after church. And let me tell you, you still have the coffee shop? Uh -huh. Okay. Well, I've had many cups of coffee and I've had many donuts there. The Krispy Kreme. Krispy Kreme. I don't think there were Krispy Kreme before. We have Krispy Kreme now. Oh, wow. We mm. <laughs> yeah, that's donuts are a thing of the past for me. Um, you have a wonderful little organ in your body, it's called a pancreas. And everything, bite of food that you take in, um, it's either vegetable or it's protein or it's a carbohydrate or it's sugar. Sugar is our big problem here. Back in the 1800s, the average person ate about five pounds of sugar a year. Now we eat very close to 400 pounds of sugar a year. The pancreas has to put out insulin to balance out the sugar. All carbs break the sugar. It might break slowly, it might break quickly, but all carbs are going to break the sugar. So the pancreas keeps putting out insulin and you more and more and more insulin to try to cover the carbs because we've, we've pretty much switched to a high carb diet. Uh, not eating like we're supposed to. There's not a person in this room that doesn't know that you need to change your eating habits. And I'm right there at the front of the line, you know. I do the best I can every day to try to make sure I'm eating like I should. And do I go off the rails? Yes, I do, every once in a while. But I get right back on it. When you're taking in all this sugar and all this insulin is being pumped out, there's a couple of things that are happening. First off, your body's becoming resistant to insulin. Anything your body has to deal with again and again and again and again and again, it kind of starts toning down those receptors because it's like getting punched all the time. So it becomes less sensitive to the insulin that's being put out. But here's the thing. Your brain functions off of one thing, glucose. And if the insulin is being flooded in your body, it's also trying to shut that sugar, that glucose down in your brain. That's the only gas that your brain can run on. You've all heard about someone who was hypoglycemic or a diabetic who was out driving down the street and was stopped by the police because they thought they were drunk. They can't talk right, they can't 
function right. They can't, their re reaction time is very poor because the brain is not getting enough glucose. Or you run into some lady who's put herself on a super drastic diet and she's just not clicking on all eight cylinders anymore. So we're taking in a diet that's causing all this insulin to flood our body and our brain and we're basically turning off the, the path to the gas tank for the brain and expecting it to keep running because we've got all this insulin out there flooding. Doesn't work well. It's hard to get away. Sugar is very addictive. You think cigarettes are addictive? Sugar is even more addictive because it's in everything. It's in soup. You, you have a hard time finding things that don't have sugar in them. You think, well, I'll drink diet. Well, <laughs> here's the deal. That wonderful little bacteria in your gut that is 70% of your immune system is the bacteria in your gut. It doesn't know what to do with that stuff, whether it's, it's uh, sweet and low or equal or um, whatever it is. It doesn't know what to do with it because it's not natural. It's not normal. It's a chemical. So you, here's your, take your pick. You, you can starve the brain so it doesn't get its fuel and invites more of those tau plaques and tangles to occur, or you can destroy the microbes in your gut and then you have no immune system. Uh, not a good choice either way. What's the, what's the alternative? Water. You're 75% water. You're not 75% Coke or Red Bull or tea or coffee. Every cup of coffee you take, let's just say it's an eight ounce, and I, I looked at, my daughter gave me a really pretty cup. I use it every morning for my coffee. And I also have one of those Keurig, and I put it under there and I punch the button and it gave me 10 ounces of coffee, and it was like the cup was half full. So it's a 12 ounce cup. None of us drink really an eight ounce cup anymore. That eight ounces of coffee that I drink is going to pull more than 12 ounces of fluid out of my body. So I'm already behind the eight ball. Whatever you weigh in pounds, and let's just say you weigh 100 pounds, that means you need 50 ounces of water every day. So you need half your weight and water in ounces every day. It's not fun. It's not pretty, it's not uh, bubbly, it's not any of those things, but it's what your body needs. And I know what's going through some of your minds. Well, if I drink that much water, how many trips to the bathroom do you think I'm going to be making? A few, but here's the deal. Your, everything in your body, your, your skin, your lungs, your kidneys, your bowels, everything is gonna benefit if you're taking in the right amount of water. And I don't know if any of you have gone down the laxity vial lately at Dillon's or CVS or Walmart and looked at the prices that they're charging on laxatives. Uh, last time I looked, if you paid your water bill, water was free out of the tap. And if you're taking in enough water, you don't need those other things because the body is regulating itself. Now it's not true on a thousand percent of the cases, but it is in 998 percent. So that's pretty good odds in your favor. <coughs> um, familial disease, there is a family in Colombia in the city of Medellin, and you've heard of that because that's usually where the, you hear about the Medellin cartel, the drug cartel. There is a family there that the World Health Organization is studying. Half of the people in the family have early onset Alzheimer's or dementia. Half of them, starting at about 30, they are not functional and they want to know why is half of this family. Now, yes, Tuesday at the Alzheimer's Association, they did bring up the fact that if you have someone with Alzheimer's directly in your family, not a spouse, but directly related to you, you do have a higher incidence. Um, it's back to you change everything you can because you can't change, uh, like the Heart Association, you can't change being male, you can't change your age, you can't change your family history, but you change everything else that you can. And you're sitting there thinking, well, I like eating what, I, what I've always ate because that's, that's what I'm used to. Well, we're all like that. Nobody likes change. Let me guarantee you, even the people that tell you they like change, 
They're telling you a big fat fib because it's not true. Um, it's hard to change things and we want to go back and, and we fall off the wagon and you know if I've had a really really stressful week or something the brain says go get me macaroni and cheese right now and I'm thinking that's not what you need. Yeah it is. That's what I want. Go get it. <clears throat> Sleep. Here's another important thing. We pride ourselves on being able, and Americans have done this for a long time, on getting, being able to function on a really small amount of sleep, you know. I can, I can get by on two or three hours of sleep. No, you can't. You just think you can. But think about the cleaning crew coming into the factory to clean up. Now, if the factory's running 24 hours a day, do you think the cleaning crew can do a very good job? No. It's proven that if you're not getting seven to nine hours sleep a night, you are again inviting more dementia into your life because that's when the brain is doing its restorative process. And some of you say, well, I, I sleep and I wake up every two hours or so forth. There's lots of reasons why we have sleep problems. Uh, most of them involve lights and these things and televisions and computers because all of these things emit blue light and the pineal gland in our brain which secretes melatonin which is that you can buy over the counter but what God makes in your brain is better than what comes on the counter <coughs> that as long as that blue light is coming into your eyes the pineal gland is being told it's daylight I don't need to do this. This this is for it's back in the caveman days. It's daylight. Get up and go find a saber-toothed tiger or a woolly mammoth, and have fixed dinner. Or it's dark. Go to bed. Period. End of story. Now we have almost universal 24-hour light if we want it. If you'll start doing what you can to monitor television, computer, cell phone, etc., and for your children, for your grandchildren, for anybody you can influence at least an hour before bedtime, you'll start getting better sleep. Doing some things about, uh, there, are all, there are clinics out there about sleep hygiene now, about what the temperature of your room should be, what you should be wearing and so forth. And it's not expensive, it's just following some principles. Start winding things down. If you normally go to bed at 10 o'clock, eight o'clock, start winding things down, you know. Let the body start revving down a little bit and start controlling those thoughts of, did I pay that bill? Did I get that done? Is the lawnmower put up? Is it going to rain tonight? Did I put the windows up? In the that all has to calm and quiet. As far as I'm concerned, reading your Bible, doing meditation, something to calm your mind, calm your brain down is probably one of the best things you can do because you will sleep like a baby after that. You know, There's a lot to be said to uh, let go and give it to God. Red wine. Um, there's some studies out there saying red wine is very helpful for you. Um, that helps keep your brain healthy. And then somebody came out and said, well, grape juice is just unfermented red wine, and everybody can drink grape juice. I mean, we have it at communion. So it's got to be good, but what's, what's grape juice full of? Sugar. What's apple juice full of? Sugar, orange juice, sugar. If you really got to have a grape or an apple or whatever, or an orange, eat it. Because the fiber in there is going to outweigh the sugar that's in the fruit itself. Fruit's called nature's candy. It has sugar in it. <coughs> Dark chocolate. My husband and I used to, every evening, we'd have one of those little bitty dove squares of dark chocolate. Thought we were really doing something good, you know. This is healthy, and it tastes pretty good. Well, here's the deal, and you've seen them, those little bitty dove squares. There's five teaspoons of sugar in that little square. The, co the, the chocolate that you need is not fun to sit there and eat. As a matter of fact, my husband says, I wish you'd quit buying that stuff because I'm not going to eat it. I said, well, you're not going to eat this stuff with the sugar either because <laughs> I'm not buying it. Uh, it needs to be 80 to 90 percent uh, chocolate cocoa. And it's not sweet. It's, it's slightly bitter. 
um, but it's very healthy for you. Cholesterol. I'm not going to say bad things about cholesterol. I'm not going to fight with your doctor, and I'm not going to get between you and your doctor, but I am going to tell you this. Fats have a bad rep, and if you're on statins, that's a scary thing that I want you to go find out for yourself about, because I will fight tooth and nail to keep my husband off of statins. His, his blood lipids are so low, and his blood pressure is so low, he'll probably live to be 200 years old. But cholesterol, your part of your brain is cholesterol, so if you're taking a statin, you actually are taking things that's doing some damage. I know I was a coronary care nurse. I ran the heart cath lab at Wesley for a lot of years. I know coronary stuff forward, backwards, and upside down. And I know what you're going to say. Well, I'm going to have a heart attack if I don't. Now, you're going to have a conversation with your physician. You are responsible for your body. You have to decide what's going into your body. So, I, like I said, I'll be happy to talk with you one-on-one -on -one with this. I, I'm not trying to upset the apple cart, but I am trying to get you to understand that there are things you can do to not go down this road. Um, exercise. Where did I just see it? And it was just this morning. It may have been on some news thing that I was on on the internet. I don't know, but it was talking about the incredible importance of exercise every day for all of us, for any way you can. If you can't do anything more than sit in a chair and do some arm exercises and some leg exercises, do it because you're keeping blood flowing. You're keeping those joints mobile. You're also decreasing your fall risk. And more than half of you in here, I know because I've probably written a thousand fall reports on people. Keeping your mobility, keeping your flexibility, keeping your ability to move well, will do nothing but help you. I teach my nursing students that half of everybody that fractures a hip is going to die in six months. And then we go through all the reasons why those people are going to die. And I even had one nursing student come back and said, you are right about that. I looked it up. I said, I'm not in the habit of lying to you. <laughs> I tell you this because you have to protect people and make sure they don't fall. But here's the bad thing. I can be standing here talking to you and my hip can fracture while I'm talking to you. It's called a pathologic fracture. Nothing can be done about it. Or I can trip over the wire and fracture my hip. Either way, I'm going to have to have surgery. And there's a whole cascade of things involved in that, going to the hospital and infections and deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolus and all kinds of things that, that go from there. The, the big thing is, the more flexible you are, the more limber you are, the more active you are, the less you're going to invite these things in your life, including dementia. And it's free, so why not do it? If it's not horribly, horribly hot, and I go out like at 6 o'clock in the morning, 5 or 6 o'clock in the morning, and I go out and walk, usually before it's too awful hot, or I go ride my horse at 6 o'clock in the morning. Puts me through a good workout. See how my time is doing? Not too much. <clears throat> I've given you lots of different ways to help correct this problem. One of the things I, wanna, I do want to bring up, and nobody likes having this conversation, so nurses are not shy about having really bad conversations with people because that's kind of our job. Um, I'll give you the information and you decide what you're going to do with it. I don't care what your age is, if you haven't gone through and decided some of your advanced directives, you need to do it. Because if you're in a crisis and your family has to start making those decisions for you, you have just heaped guilt and, and stress all over them. They, you need to have something written down. All of you have heard of uh, Karen Ann Quinlan and Terry Schiavo. I teach ethics for Tabor College, legal issues and ethics. And Neither one of those cases would have come to light had they had papers signed by them that says, if something happens to me, this is what I want done. No, it had to go through courts, family fights, Supreme Court, and in the case of uh, Karen Ann Quinlan, young lady um, who wound up being uh, persistently brain dead, 
was on a ventilator. Her husband went to court, got the right to take her off the ventilator, and they took her off the ventilator. And what do you think happened to Karen Ann when they took her off? She kept breathing. She kept on for quite a while. Um, had she had papers, if something happens to me, this is what I want done, she may not have gone on in the first place. She died about three or four years after they took her off the ventilator. Um, but think about the stress on the family, the cost and everything else. And every once in a while you'll hear, oh, someone woke up after a coma, out of a coma after 10 years. You hear about that because it almost never happens. 99% uh, of the times it's not going to happen. Then think about it. If you were in a hospital and you couldn't make those decisions for yourself anymore, do you want somebody putting a feeding tube in you? Do you want to be put on a ventilator? Do you want to be started on dialysis? That, there's no right, no wrong answer. It's all up to you. But you're the one that needs to make those decisions and have those papers uh, drawn up and have them signed. I have a copy. We've had, my husband and I have had them for years, have them with our doctor and our lawyer, and our children have copies of it so they know exactly what to do if something happens. It just makes life a whole lot easier for everybody. <clears throat> if you had done, haven't looked at your legal affairs, uh, I just met with a financial advisor. Uh, my husband and I did, and this is not the first time I've heard this, that uh, the husband and the wife had retired. They were quite happy with everything, and the husband died. He had been at Boeing for years and years and years had a 401k out there, um, you know, it was substantial amount of money. His ex-wife was still on the beneficiary. It was never changed over to his current wife. And his ex-wife got the entire estate. His wife of 30 years got nothing, you know. These are not pleasant things to have to do, but it's, it's not that uncomfortable to sit down and get them done and look at them and make sure everything is in order. Um, you know, the best we can hope for is that one day we're just going to go to bed and get all snuggy in our pillow and, and when we open our eyes we see Jesus. And, you know, hallelujah, great. Um, but sometimes it doesn't work out quite that well. If you've got Alzheimer's and dementia, what usually takes you is you lose the ability, your brain loses the ability to tell you what to do with fluids and food. So you get to a point where it's not safe for us to give you fluids because you're going to choke. And the same way with food, you're going to choke on the food, you're going to have aspiration pneumonia because it's going to go down in your lungs. Now, what your family has to decide, well, are we going to put a feeding tube in them? So, you make those decisions and you let people know what they are. Um, if you want a feeding tube, that's fine. But you're the one that needs to make those decisions. One other little thing, and then I'm going to open it up for questions. Um, this is also a problem all of us have. Clutter, things, stuff. You need to start getting rid of some of that stuff now because the kids don't want all that stuff to have to take care of. Um, there's a uh, realtor here in town, the Ambrose team, she, uh, Catherine Ambrose is who does the uh, Empowered Senior Series, and that's a TV show on Channel 8 too. And she also has a component called Doodah Downsizing, and that's starting to get some of that stuff out now uh, before somebody else has to deal with it, you know. Have, have, the, have the church have a big garage sale and, and bring it over here and get it sold and put more money in the coffers of Asbury or whatever you want to do with it. But I have a philosophy at my house, 20 things every month leave my house. And my big thing is that I make sure my husband doesn't bring in 22. <laughs> and it gets really sneaky sometimes. It's like, I mean, I, I'm probably the only woman in Wichita that cringes when I see garage, the sign says garage sales and estate sales, because I'm praying that he doesn't get anywhere near that. <laughs> or he walks in the door, what is that? Where, why do you have it? What are we going to do with it? Where am I going to store it? You know, it's too much stuff. So start, start doing some downsizing. And we actually have a garage sale this upcoming Thursday and Friday. You're welcome to start dropping off stuff starting tomorrow. <laughs> and I didn't even know that. <laughs> 
Um, that's the biggest part. I have I have pretty much run out of time. Um, we started a little late, so if you want to go a little longer, okay. sure we're all we're all enjoying here. Um, I'm going to can since I've I've given you what I've kind of given you your marching orders about diet and exercise and sleep. Oh, coffee, coffee, coffee is a great thing. Coffee apparently is the largest antioxidant that Americans or the world consumes on a regular basis. And it doesn't make any difference if it's decaffeinated or it's caffeinated. And I'll tell you now, the older you get, the less caffeine likes your bladder. And some of you know what I'm talking about. You drink a cup of coffee and before you can finish the cup, you've got to make a trip. But Coffee itself is shown, there's research out there that shows that uh, coffee is good for you, so keep drinking your coffee. Um, funeral issues, if you don't have a plan, you need to have a plan. I talked to a mortician or a gentleman that owned a funeral home lately, and he said, there's a problem out there that none of you realize. He said, I got a call from the nursing home close to him and he went over and he picked up someone and he brought him back and when he brought him back he found out they had no insurance or anything else and the family was under the assumption that Social Security was going to pay for the funeral. Yeah, they're going to pay $255. Nowhere close to what the funeral cost. But here's the thing, it's not funny but it kind of is. Once you've got the body it's kind of like a hot potato because nobody wants it, and you're stuck with it. So you got to do something. So, might be given some thought, you know, looking at your, your insurance and so forth and how things are taken care of. And I hate to be Debbie Downer, but these are, these are just things that someone will uh, be very thankful for later on, that they don't have to worry about dealing with these problems. Uh, if you're part of a church family, which you all are, you're in phenomenal shape because you've got huge support from your church. And none of us can get by without having that kind of family behind us. Um, whether you see your church family all the time or you just see them once in a while, you still have that family. And we all know any number of people have been here at Asbury that I can remember that uh, had a problem and, and to a person this church stepped up in a heartbeat without being asked to take care of things. Support groups, I always tell people there are multiple um, support groups out there, whether it's AA or NA or um, Weight Watchers or um, Alzheimer's and dementia. You need people that have been through the problem and maybe they know better ways. None of us know everything, but you have information and you have information and you have information and when we put that together, we all grow from that. So support groups are really important. The Alzheimer's Association fails 97.5% of the time, but they're succeeding about that much. At least they're doing something. It's on us to try to do what we can to make the load a little bit less. So, Someone asked about housing and dementia. Oh, it was Daryl. And uh, I said, sadly, we're so far behind the rest of the world, it isn't funny. Um, I believe it's, it's either Sweden or Norway, and I really have to get my facts down. And there's a possibility this might be starting in the United States. They have communities that are set up for people with dementia. And they're just like any small town that you walk into. That They're very secure. There is a wall or a fence or something. We know these people are kept very secure. But they're, the, they can, they're just out with everybody. They can go to the grocery store. They can go to the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker, the shoe store. If they want to sit down and take a nap on the bench, they can do that because the entire town is set up for people with dementia. So we don't have that go back to your room. No, you can't go through that door. No, nope, can't go outside. No, nope, get away from the door going to put an ankle bracelet on you, going to treat you like you're in jail. We don't have any other way to keep people in a facility, you know, other than to put an ankle monitor on them, which is called a wonder guard. 
because it's a $10,000 fine when somebody walks outside that door. That's what the state of Kansas is going to impose on the facility, $10,000. Rather, they get one foot away or they get them 10 miles away. They're still going to get fined on that. Um, they're spending millions of dollars to find a cure, and I hope the Alzheimer's Association's right. right. I hope that person that, has, that finds a cure, I hope they're out there. Um, but I also have to remember that nothing's 100%, and whether it happens in our lifetime or it happens in our children's lifetime, I'm, it's gonna be what it's gonna be. Questions? Now that I've laid out some of the bad facts, what are some of your questions? Can you give us any tips on caring for a person? Caring uh, in the home or in the facility? Which? Home. Home. Um, I would be working with somebody like Gus because there are there are monitoring things that are that we have now that weren't out there five years ago to be able to tell what's going on with people, uh, securing the house, getting help in the house because you can't do it by yourself. Uh, there's a lot of education. I work with families in their home to try to tailor programs to help them get along as best they can. Um, hospice, towards the end. Hospice is a wonderful organization to be using. Um, in a nutshell, get a hold of me. I'll be happy to sit down and discuss it with you, but um, you have to have help. You can't do it by yourself. And for some reason, it usually falls on one person in the family. Um, yeah. Usually it's the daughter. It if there's no daughters, then it falls on the son. And, and um, you know, not just your husband has Alzheimer's, now you can no longer work. Your mom has Alzheimer's, and there's nobody to take care of her, now you can no longer work. So the impact that has on your children, your grandchildren. That help? A little bit. It's a big complex issue. What else? Um, can you speak at all to the effects of anesthesia? And because my mom changed drastically after, after her hip anesthesia. surgery. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We know that things change after um, she had heart surgery. Um, no, her. She had one of those where her hip snapped, and that's why she fell, and so she had to okay. have her hip pinned okay. and repaired okay. and woke up an entirely different person entirely different than my person. mother. That happens more than we, than we care to admit. Uh, we used to call it post-pump psychosis when people we were doing bypass surgery on everybody because the pump couldn't mimic the flow as well as the heart does. You know, you are a perfect creature made by God. Um, but the anesthesia doesn't affect older people like it does younger people, and the studies haven't been done on older people. I'm glad you brought that up because that brings up Prevagen and CBD too. Um, they need to, the anesthesiologist needs to be extremely careful. Not that they're not, but they need to be, you know, we don't want somebody else waking up. I want my mom back. Um, but when you have to go under anesthesia, these are things you need to think about. Um, Prevagen, Neurogen, there's another one out there, I don't remember what it is. You know, the, the number one pharmacist recommended brain supplement. I get asked this question all the time. So I looked up Prevagen. Prevagen is a bunch of vitamins. I don't know what part of that jellyfish went in there, because mainly it's vitamins. Uh, it's fairly expensive vitamins. It's not doing any harm. Is it doing any good? Here's the thing, we don't know. The supplement industry is not regulated like the uh, Food and Drug Administration is. So the supplement industry can say, you know, take this, take this uh, bottle of whatever and you'll be perfect. Everything will be great. Uh, you'll probably grow tons of hair and your eyelashes will grow long and thick and you'll lose 30 pounds and, you know, that's not true. Uh, anybody of you remember Bufferin? The, the medication buffering. Mm -hmm. Do you know what the buffering agent in Bufferin was? Nothing. That was its name. You assumed it would do something because its name was 
buffering. It's, it's tricks like that that are played. It's, it's not fair to the public. Um, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. I get lots and lots of questions about CBD. I was just in family video the other day and uh, I, had a, I won a free video. And when I got to the desk and she said, oh, she said, are you having aches and pains? And I said, no. She says, do you have a headache? No. Do you have asthma? No. What is this? I'm in a video store. <laughs> and she said, well, we have CBD. And I said, I noticed that. <laughs> and I said, I don't know what I think. I said, I'm a nurse and I don't know what I think about this stuff yet. Well, it works for this and this and this and this. And I said, okay, where's the research? Well, there isn't any. Okay, we're not having this discussion anymore. Until I see the research, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm grounded in science, and that's the way I am. Uh, if you can't prove it to me, I'm not taking it. <laughs> does it help? I'm sure it does. Here's the one thing I learned, that it helps women more than men because it, it, it attaches to estrogen receptors. And men have some estrogen receptors, but we have a whole lot more. And I'm sure it helps some men, but it helps women more than men. I don't know. Ten years down, down the road, we'll see what, what's going on then with it. Anything else? Yes? I have been told that a leave uh -huh. can cause dementia, Alzheimer's, and like that. Kind of, sort of, and not exactly. Um, any of you remember what uh, Celebrex or Vioxx, well, we have Motrin too. Those were COX-2 inhibitors that stopped arthritis pain and so forth. Uh, Vioxx was pulled off the market, oh, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago. Celebrex is still out there. Uh, they were finding lots of people having heart attacks on these drugs. And I had a friend of mine found out I was taking um, Vioxx, and he about had a cow, and he said, my wife died with that stuff. You can't take that. I said, well, I'm not dead yet. Um, but they're even implicating that the, the anti-inflammatories of Aleve and Motrin, uh, which is um, uh, naproxen is Aleve, and ibuprofen's Motrin, Advil, whatever you want to call it, they've also been implicated in having an increase in cardiac arrest. I'm gonna tell you what, if I've got a bad headache, I'm still grabbing a leave and I'm still grabbing a couple of Motrin because I'd rather, you know, I'm gonna risk it to get rid of the headache. What else am I gonna do? What should I do? I should do what my body tells me to do. I should go lay down and maybe put a cold cloth over my eyes and take a 15 minute nap and let my mind clear. But, you know, we're kind of stubborn creatures and we're gonna go do what we need to do and the consequences are going to happen whether or not we do it. Anything else? So while we're being honest, you need seven to nine hours of sleep, but you're up every two to three hours to go to the bathroom and it's broken sleep. Is that still better than five or six hours of sleep or what, what do you do? <laughs> and a lot of you are having that problem. Um, it's not as good because you don't get a chance to go through. You need to be in the deep REM sleep for the clearing of the toxins to occur, and that's when your really restorative process takes place is in the REM sleep. It's not as good. You may have to manage and say at eight o'clock at night, stop your water consumption, um, probably have a bathroom trip before you go to bed. You might be able to get you know five, five hours sleep and then a quick potty trip and back to bed but try to get that other three or four hours sleep. Yeah, I know, it's, it's called old kidneys and old bladders. And so how long does it take to get into the uh, REM sleep? It's di a little different for everyone. Uh, they say normally you cycle about every uh, 90 minutes. Um, oddly enough, if you have, uh, we have six rescue cats. If you have pets, you're not going to get as deep a sleep, uh, whether you think so or not. And I have a cat who slept with me for nine years, and I, I'm not sure I could go to sleep without him in the room. But they do wake you up. They, they wake you up just enough to come up out of that deep sleep. They turn over, they stretch, 
and this one smacks me if I move, and I tell you what, getting smacked at three o'clock in the morning with a little awful uh, claws, not happy. Get the cats and dogs out of the bedroom. Get your bedroom cool, get it dark. Um, do the best you can. Manage your potty trips. Um, there's nothing really easy about bladders and kidneys to start aging, but you just deal with it. Anything else? Okay. Thank you so much. You're more than Kathy. welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Folks, we do um, have the room for uh, a little bit longer, so you don't have to run off. I don't know how long Kathy can be here, but I'm sure if you think of something that you would like to ask her, she's willing to hang out. H how long can we keep you for? However long you need me. Okay, so she's here for a little bit with us. Um, Gus is here if you have some questions for him. Um, as many of you here know, this topic is near and dear to my heart because we just put my mom in Catholic care memory care. And I had a care plan meeting this Tuesday and um, she's at the end of stage five and the beginning of stage six, which means, and stage seven is the last. Um, and they can't really tell us exactly how long that's gonna be. Um, it could be three or five years yet even. Um, watching her decline quickly, I don't think we have that long. Um, I cannot reiterate to you how much it helps my brother and I to know what her wishes are. And her, my mom and my dad both told us their wishes while they were very cognate and had it all signed out. So we have the legal paperwork to back us up to say, no, we are, we are going no further. We, we are having no more surgeries. We are having no more things to prolong her life because there is no quality that comes with quantity for my mother. And I cannot tell you what a relief it is to know exactly what she wants to do. I cannot, I cannot tell you enough. Please, please, please. I mean, I wish, I'm so glad you all are here, but I wish we would have gotten more people my age and even younger here. Because my husband and I at 53, we really do have to get our act together. We need to start looking into long-term care. We need to start looking into our paperwork for our children. Um, because you just don't know. You just don't know when it's gonna happen or what might happen. And it is so much easier on the family when we know. So um, just to throw that out there, um, because it is, um, it's very, very near and dear to my heart. My father passed five years ago. He can't make these decisions. As all good husbands do, he hid this from his children because it was his wife, right? So we walked into it and figured it out as we go. And that's why um, I'm, I'm thankful Kathy's here. That's why we had our summer senior seminars last year, which you know we're gonna look into doing something different again next year, but I wanna keep promoting this thing. We want to take kind of the stigma out of end of life and death because it's a fact of life unless you're Methuselah or, um, you know, one of the, oh, who was the prophet who was running and then he just was taken up into heaven? Elijah. Thank you. Right? So unless you're Elijah or someone like that, we all are going to face death. But thankfully, um, if you know Jesus, it's actually eternal life, not death. So we want to approach end of life with hope and with positive things and with being able to equip our families to help us deal with that when we can't deal with it ourselves. So um, we really appreciate you being there. If you have any other like church questions, I'm here for that too. I'm the congregational care pastor here at Asbury Church, so I am the one who gets calls at odd hours of day and night, and I'm thankful I can do that for you. That's the gift God has given me. So. Um, I'm happy to answer those questions too, but thank you, thank you so much for being here and thank you.